All right, Lewis. Wow and amaze us. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. My name is uh, Louis Goff and I am um, in the right up stage of my PhD at the University of the West of England. Um, my doctoral research concerns the anti-anthropocentric capacity of mainstream vegan discourse. Um, I've conducted a critical discourse analysis of the online advocacy output of 12 leading vegan organizations and five um, leading vegan activists with an interest in the ways in which their discourses undermine and or perpetuate the ideology of anthropocentrism. Um, should change slide, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so following Matthew Kalako, among others, I define anthropocentrism as the narcissistic centering of human humans and human interests in the delusional belief that the human animal is wholly distinct from and superior to those beings typically considered animal or otherwise non-human. Of vital importance to my talk today is the fact that um, who counts as human is limited beyond species. That is to say, it is not just non-human animals who are subordinated by anthropocentrism as merely animals, but also historically and ongoingly, many human groups uh, and uh, many humans and human groups. In the West, anthropocentrism doesn't center the biologically human so much as it so much as the so-called quintessentially human. That is the white, cis male, heterosexual, able-bodied, property owning, et cetera, human. And simultaneously dehumanizes and animalizes those who do not match this narrowly, narrow and entirely fabricated template. So in order to truly understand and overcome institutionalized oppressive thinking, writes Robin Trigg, we must view different oppressions as a connected map and intersectionality, the theory originally developed by Kimberly Crenshaw in the context of black feminism, can be used to inform our understandings of the interconnected oppressions of humans and non-human animals, not least through the process of animalization. An intersectional approach to vegan advocacy would successfully, and I quote, decenter the archetypal human in a way that benefits both marginalized humans, uh, human groups and other animals, explains Trigg. And it is in this capacity to, to decenter the so-called archetypal human that makes intersectionality indispensable to efforts to subvert anthropocentrism for the benefit of all. Um, so of secondary importance to my talk today are my general findings from my research, which I'll just briefly note here before honing in on my findings pertaining to intersectionality. Um, <clears throat> so very quickly, the advocates um, of my study um, subverted anthropocentrism primarily through non-human animal centered conceptions of veganism by foregrounding the interests of non-human animals and simultaneously trivializing human interests, uh, the human interest in exploiting them by revealing the brutally, sorry, by revealing the brutality of so-called animal products via exposés and non-euphemistic language which foregrounded the non-human victims of said products, and by blurring the human-animal false dichotomy through rejections of speciesist limitations of everyday language. That said, often these same organizations and activists reinforced anthropocentric thinking through centering human interests via health and human-centric environmental concerns and narcissistic ethical considerations, i.e. those centered around the practitioner's well-being, as opposed to anti-oppression for the victim's sake or by playing into the human animal dualism, or by portraying vegan practitioners as heroes and saviors, um, and non-human animals as cute and passive victims, worthy of ethical consideration due only to their perceived intelligence or lovability. And finally, by, failing, uh, by falling short of condemning all forms of non-human animal exploitation and subordination. Um, so I recently published an article in Relations Beyond Anthropocentrism, which discusses a sample of my data from just three key vegan advocacy organizations, which is available um, there, there's a link there. Um, and of course, I hope to make use of all of my PhD findings in future publications. So <clears throat> now onto the findings of particular relevance to this conference focus, which is intersectionality, of course. So my intention was to discern the level of intersectional awareness or lack thereof displayed by the advocates and in turn the level of intersectional consideration that allowed for or, be, or better yet encouraged by the advocates in their promotion of veganism. Um, I don't know why the image hasn't 
isn't displaying, but it's not a problem. Um, the first frame through which intersectional awareness was displayed was uh, the presenting of veganism as part of a broader struggle against oppression. Our world is plagued with many serious problems, all of which deserve attention. Cruelty to animals is one of them, right Peter, for example. Whilst Animal Rising state that they stand alongside other groups striving for justice, including climate campaigners, striking workers, indigenous communities, and more. Typifying intersectional awareness of this kind was Afro-vegan society, who promote Afro-veganism as a vehicle for resisting and solution to the oppressive systems that underpin both non-human animal exploitation and race-based oppression. By resisting the privileged and ultimately ignorant notion of non-human animals as the final, sorry, of non-human animal rights as the final frontier of social change, the advocates here avoided overlooking interrelated human oppressions. However, such efforts were undermined when organizations such as Go Vegan World presented animal rights as the most important social justice issue of our time. Following the securing of women's rights, civil rights, and other human, human rights, they state, it is now the turn of other animals to secure their rights. Or Gentle World, who claim the struggles of racism, slavery, women, queer rights, and the like pale in comparison to non-human animal exploitation. Equally counterproductive were direct comparisons between human and non-human animal exploitation, evident in descriptions of the latter as a modern day slave trade or an ongoing Holocaust, for example, which um, the much criticized organization PETA continued to defend. As elucidated by several scholars, regardless of arguable severity and numerical accuracy, said comparisons overlook the ongoing reality of human oppressions and in turn exclude marginalized communities. They, by instrumentalizing human suffering to make a point about non-human suffering, fail to challenge the anthropocentric foundations of either. In Mo Constantine's words, they fail to challenge the moral hierarchy um, which places both blackness and anim animality at the bottom. And ultimately they reveal, and I quote, the unmarked whiteness of mainstream veganism. Um, several of the advocates did, on the other hand, encourage intersectional consideration by highlighting the plights of humans exploited through employment in, non, in the uh, animal industrial complex, which renders them inextricably linked to the exploitation of non-human animals. Afro-vegan society, for example, discussed the worker abuse and human exploitation that is built into the egg industry. Uh, it goes without saying that black and brown people black and brown communities make up the majority of the workforce, they write. Slaughterhouse workers often suffer from repetitive stress injuries, musculoskeletal disorders, chronic pain, and psychological trauma, explained Farm Sanctuary. Whilst Gentle World cite research that has pointed out a correlation between towns and slaughterhouses and higher rates of domestic violence and violent crimes, including rape and murder. That said, so, such efforts were, again, inconsistent. Other advocates condemn the ostensible, ostensibly intentional cruelty of workers, demonizing vulnerable and highly exploited individuals through a framing described by Corey Wren as not only racist, but classist. And comparison, um, said comparisons impede consideration of interconnected systems of oppression and how our lifestyles support and perpetuate these oppressive systems by placing blame on individualized workers, Wren persuasively argues. Relatedly, a handful of advocates adopted colonial white savior narratives um, through specific denouncements of non-Western practices such as halal slaughter. These campaigns reflect, involve, and perpetuate discrimination against humans, writes Gary Francione, e, um, and ultimately failed to challenge non-human animal exploitation as a whole. So back to intersectional awareness, the interconnections between the production and consumption of so-called animal products and health and environmental inequalities were repeatedly foregrounded, um, such as the dietary racism of US dietary guidelines, which promote dairy consumption to predominantly lactose intolerant communities, described in the Afro-Vegan Society video as mere information, a form of institutional racism, or the health ailments of low income communities of color living near toxic agribusiness facilities condemned by Farm Sanctuary as environmental racism, 
or the dietary colonialism of feeding around a third of our global crop production to other animals whilst one in nine people in the world today are undernourished, as explained by Viva, forming part of what Go Vegan World label white, race, uh, white supremacist policies that leave countries, people and other animals much more vulnerable to climate disasters. <clears throat> These efforts contribute significantly to the decentering of the privileged white experience and begin to elucidate components of the interrelated interrela nature of human and non-human oppressions. Um, unfortunately, however, the, the Western white male perspective was centered in a variety of uh, other ways within the discourse, including the emphasis of vegan consumerism and voting with your wallet, which arguably commodifies veganism and in turn blunts its capacity to oppose inherently exploitative, the inherently exploitative nature of capitalism. In the words of Bob Torres, this brand of veganism will never be able to make real connections with other movements or forms of oppression. Or by appropriating and misunderstanding non-Western religious ideas such as the Hindu Ahimsa, which Rama Ganeshan explains does not constitute veganism. The activist Joey Carbstrong was particularly offensive in this connection demanding that the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, and I quote, bestow some of his Hindu practices on UK agriculture and practice Ahimsa. And through depictions of vegan strength and bravery, which perpetuated the hegemonic masculinity ideals that stand in direct opposition to efforts to decenter the anthropocentric human. So the final theme identified in my data pertaining to intersectionality that I have time to quickly discuss here ref relates to accessibility. <clears throat> As has been stressed by contributors to um, Julia Feller's Brooks' excellent anthology, Veganism in, in an Oppressive World, among other places, portraying veganism is easy, such as the vegan society's Go Ve Going Vegan is actually a piece of cake, or many of the organization's uncritical promotions of whole foods and specialist ingredients, disregards experiences of those lacking economic and geographical access to said ingredients, thus centering the privileged middle-class ex experience. Afro-vegan society, on the other hand, described their mission as providing free re resources to people in marginalized communities to make vegan living accessible. Awareness of, this access awareness of accessibility not being a given to all like this was apparent in only some of the advocates' discourse, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's a shame that my pictures haven't come up, come up. I put effort into those, but anyway. Um, so just in conclusion then, as was discussed in the introduction of my talk, my PhD concerns the capacity of vegan discourse to decenter the human, to subvert the destructive arrogance of anthropocentrism that underpins non-human, human and environmental exploitation. As clarified, however, the human that is centered by anthropocentrism is not the biological human but the so-called archetypal or quintessential human, the colonial capitalist patriarchal human who oppresses the non-human and human other by the process of dehumanization and animalization. Non-human animals and otherwise humans are excluded from the so-called master category of the exalted human, which as worded by Val Plumwood, explains the conceptual links between different categories of domination Said exclusion reveals the inextricably linked nature of oppressions in anthropocentric societies. It is this interconnectedness that makes intersectional consideration vital to non-human animal rights efforts. Although veganism constitutes a movement specifically created to oppose the injustices forced on non-humans by humans, as Brooke writes, consistency in anti-oppression for all is vital in our fight for non-human justice. When intersectionality is at the heart of vegan advocacy efforts, veganism lives up to its potential as an indispensable, indispensable tactic among, among others for resisting, and I quote, white supremacist capitalism and its intersecting systems of oppression. Thank you. Right. There it goes, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So today I will be talking about uh, research I'm conducting on the Basque children's media television. Um, and it's titled the Species, Values and Contradictions, Investigating on Human Animal Portrayals in Basque Children's Media on Idu Kluba. So uh, this specific research is focused on children-oriented content because uh, it reflects the concern not, and core values not only of the current society, but also in the kind of things that uh, future generations will want to be educated on. 
and it has been previously argued that it can and does promote uh, the indoctrination or the socialization of children into accepting certain instrumental and uses of animals that include uh, anthropocentric values and specific norms and values. Now, within this uh, systemic uh, socialization, uh, studying the representation of other animals in children's media, and specific, specifically public television, we see, which is outside of the streaming services, uh, something that a lot of children consume, uh, offers a valuable insight into not only the socialization of children into human or human animal relationships, but also into other kinds of power dynamics. Now, uh, what is Irio Kuluva and what is the case, the case of the study that I am working on? Um, it is a children's club of the public television of the Basque Country. And it's apart from being in the public television with the usual programming, it also offers a web page with a streaming service uh, that is divided in different age ranges. Now, uh, within this uh, research, I'm focusing on the identification and analysis of the different discourses and representations that the shows promote on no human animals, no human animal relationships, and also specist or potentially anti species values, norms and practices. These are done in interconnection with both environmental and gender equality values, as well as other issues. And I also focus on the contradictions that might be surfacing among the catalog. This is done by looking at the portrayals uh, and using a coding protocol and conducting a multimodal al analysis afterwards of the specific case studies. Now, even if the studies shows are available on several different platforms and also the public televisions, these ones have been specifically selected by the Basque public uh, uh, television, dubbed and also connected to specific uh, educative and social goals. They talk about gender equality, critical and responsible attitudes, uh, skills like encouragement of friendship and cooperation, entertainment, and the issue here is that there is no specific goal for non-human animal ethics or uh, knowledge, even if there is some connected to environmental ones. So uh, regarding the results, uh, one of the main relationships between humans and non-humans is that of children and other animals. These kind of relationships are mostly based on companionship and mutual care and understanding. And most of the non-humans appear in these TV shows actually are in a state of semi-freedom, semi-wildness situation, and not in a full domesticity uh, situation. Moreover, it is usually the non-human who is seeking connection or a relationship with the human in these cases. Now, um, Outside of these uh, systems of domination, such as specism, are actually being naturalized, rationalized, and ritualized in this context, because most of the animals are actually positioned with, uh, within a hierarchy, um, specifically one that is more than animal, but less than human kind of continuum, and that goes from affectionate to a more of a utilitarian situation. Usually, other animals are um, part of the background or are stereotypically based uh, and portrayed, but when they are not uh, the actual uh, characters of the show and they are more of an, uh, companions to the humans, they are usually appearing as food, props, symbolic, or uh, as part of what makes the human character uh, the protagonist or, or having, for example, a concern for the environmental care of the, of the area. Now, um, as we can see here, uh, a lot of the time, um, animal-based products are around, are shown as food and connected to childhood or, in, or children consuming meat or actually preferring it to other uh, vegetables or other kinds of foods and also very connected to sweetness, positive emotions and things that really they really enjoy sharing and doing, such as eating uh, cake and with a really, really a strong emotion to eat and positive portrayal. Now, uh, when no human animals are the protagonists, um, there is this kind of divide, not only when it comes to the use or kind of roles they have, but also the kind of moral coding that they get. Uh, specific moral traits are usually also associated to specific species. Dogs, horses are shown as companion animals, as protagonists, uh, even sometimes as workers while uh, certain reptiles, rats are shown as villains as, uh, and as morally corrupt, uh, not even anti-heroes, even if they have redeeming arcs later on. 
Now, uh, certain other animals, for example, something that surprised me was the uh, amount of times that black cats would appear as bad luck or evil or villainous characters in these TV shows and as uh, individuals who would face harm, but also would uh, not receive compassion or recognition of, uh, of pain when these kind of villain uh, animals were being harmed, because even when it happens in a screen, it would be shown as something comedic. Now, uh, connected to these misconceptions of other real life behaviors, um, apart from villainized, they are also vilified or made look as less intelligent than or less capable than they might be as a species. So connected to this, for example, chickens tend to be uh, portrayed in a really ridiculed way. And um, these kind of stereotypes might actually end up influencing people's attitudes around the abilities um, and way of behaving towards other animals. This promotes a specism in a collectivist understanding of a species. For example, fishes and insects will be shown as part of an ecosystem that is important, but as food at the same time, and as not relevant as individuals at all, lacking the possibility of having empathy in the process. Now, environmentally, um, the portrayal of non-humans is really strongly connected with environmental concern that the characters in these TV shows have. Humans and non-humans are shown as protectors of nature, and this is a value that they are really working hard on uh, showing to children. But non-human animals, uh, in contrary of how humans are portrayed, they are the embodiment of this kind of need of protection and care. And they are shown in connection to this importance of ecosystemic balance, let's say. So within this concern, it is really interesting to see that uh, capitalistic characters or individuals with capitalistic or greed or accumulative kind of characteristics are shown as evil or ridiculed, be it uh, something that is shown in a human or a non-human character. So profiting from natural resources would be condemned if it is done for greed, but for example, uh, things like fishing are shown either as good or bad, depending on uh, the fact that it is being balanced and maintained um, and the harms are being distributed between the communities. So for example, if humans are being fed, then it would be, um, it would be okay. But if it is being done, for example, for touristic uh, reasons or showing a place for uh, people from, that are coming to look at the fishes, then it would be wrong. Then uh, the harm distribution in this case and uh, the human centered conflict would be more important than the individual themselves. Now, when it comes to intervention or not, there is a really interesting divide when it comes to environmental issues and harms, because most of the harms that we see animals facing are actually natural. We're talking about fires, uh, lack of food, and other issues like this. And the intervention actually depends on the closeness and risk that humans will have to it, and whether or not uh, the main character would be um, facing harm. So for example, we can see predation as something that is harmful if it is being done uh, by certain species like reptiles or sharks, for example, that are being demonized. But then if it's something that is being done by a dolphin or a human, then there is no harm to it or shown as such. Um, we can also see that there are some instances of kind of a resistance or direct action or boycott situations happening when it comes to environmental harm. So in episodes where there will be, for example, um, a harming by extraction you know, of nat natural resources uh, from some dunes, uh, the main characters would try to boycott the capitalistic uh, character from actually profiting of that by harming the environment. Now, uh, the gender equality situation is actually something that surprised me because the, the type of coding protocol I prepared and what I read in literature wasn't what I expected. Well, it didn't match the results that I actually ended up finding with the TV shows. Because even if many plots are centered in proving after a conflict that girls can also do what boys do in a very binary kind of way, or girls don't need rescuing, most of the characters uh, at the end of the day um, are the ones, uh, girls are the ones that are needing help, needing rescue, or actually needing to be taught a certain lesson. There is a very big prevalence of a kind of downblown stereotype within characters. So um, 
it will only be girls that have this kind of characterization and it will happen regardless of um, this individual being human or not human and something that uh, um, didn't appear in, in the literature either but i found quite often here was the fat phobia specifically uh, connected to femininity and girls so the empowerment uh, arcs or uh, situations in which the girls are being actually shown as more complex, uh, sometimes androgynous even. Um, the empowerment always comes from an ability of doing physical things and occupying a space. And it has also appeared in a lot of instances associated to hunting, to violence or to harming animals and exerting physical power over other individuals. This is not taken as something serious, but um, as something that is part of the character and the empowerment of how girls also deserve to occupy these kind of spaces. As previously mentioned, the type of uh, harms can be natural harms, which are the most common ones. Uh, no human, no human animal harm, specifically predation, but in most cases demonized if it happens on a screen. And then human-made harm, which can be uh, connected to the environment, but it is mostly uh, shown in hunting, fishing, or in comedic relief. When it is a human-made harm, unless it is done by a kind of greedy character who shows no purpose to it other than accumulation of, of, um, of some elements, um, it is actually shown as something positive, as something that is part of the history of, huma of humanity, or as something that we should appreciate because it is fully necessary. Now, some of the main contradictions found in this content is that um, while being used by humans, the characters will show that non-human animals actually um, make these choices freely, that the, it is kind of um, consented domestication and that is based on trust. Uh, only when the main character is considered fully free in the TV show, um, this kind of domestication can be shown as something imposed and unethical. But usually during the at the end of the episode, uh, the non-human animal learns that it is for their best to actually have this kind of trust or power dynamic with a human character. Now, uh, to conclude with uh, with the study, uh, the portrayal of non-human animals in this specific media for children is actually not something that should be understood outside of the anthropocentric and species power dynamics. Most of the kind of portrayals that I have been able to see show some kind of romantic or even unrealistic and misleading images of the conditions where animals are actually consenting to being used. Um, a lot of re uh, representations are stereotyped um, based on morality characters, and a lot of non-humans only show a value or are portrayed with a value because of their ecosystemic importance with this increase of um, ecology-related plots. Now, while human oppressions are embodied by the anthropomorphized you know, human characters, um, these kind of oppressions are actually being naturalized, such as certain instances of sexism or girlhood as something negative or comedic. Um, there is this desirability that is ascribed upon the non-human animals of insertion into human society, but from a power dynamic situation where non-human animals are actually tamed, and there is this uh, happy farm myth uh, we can also see this, distinct, this distinction between acceptable and unacceptable predation, where humans will be shown as predators in a way that is socially accepted, but when no human animals predate, is considered violent, and even if they're omnivores in the main characters, they will not uh, eat meat unless it's already uh, it already doesn't look like an animal on the screen. Now, uh, women and girls as leading or side characters, they have increased in these TV shows and in the ongoing TV shows, but femininity and girlhood is still ridiculed if it is too much. And plots about equality are centered around physical power and after harming animals as well as fat, fat phobia only when it is connected to girlhood. And to finish with, um, I think that there are a lot of different media and, and vegan uh, TV shows that are showing other options and that maybe outside of this public television, I would be, be able to see other narratives. But at the moment, uh, this public television really needs to show or incorporate values such as 
learning more about other species in a way that understands the same as themselves, acknowledging the significance of their realities, even if they are not mammals protagonists or do not have a key role in an ecosystem. Thank you. Can you see me? Okay, sure can. looks perfect. Okay, fantastic. So good morning, everyone. I'm Gwendolyn Innocencio. I am a PhD candidate in the English department, and I focus on rhetoric at Texas A&M University. And my paper, um, one second, I can't see some. There we go. My paper, The Gaze Matters, The Rhetoric of Place as Protest in Ridley Scott's film Blade Runner, and um, borrows and extends several scholars' working definitions of space and place to analyze the dove in the final scene of Ridley Scott's 1982 film Blade Runner as an ignored human-non-human -human intersection. I avoid the film's obvious instances of humans exploiting human replicants to instead speak of the less obvious, animal exploitation as a critique of speciesism. So I pronounce the dove disappeared and reduced to a symbol, and doing so through a vegan studies lens disrupts the human gaze, protests animals, uh, animal exploitation, and challenges the dominant culture of species tendencies, a step toward total liberation from systemic oppression. Whoops. Oh, why will it not go? Hold on. There we go. Okay, I look at the final iconic scene in Blade Runner, Tears in the Rain, and unfortunately time doesn't allow the full four minute video clip. So here I present a still frame. I acknowledge this still frame impinges on my argument that the dove is ignored because frozen in focus, it becomes centered. So as a result, I challenge you to later watch the scene in motion to garner the full effect of my analysis. And viewed in action, the dove's treatment becomes problematic and rhetorically significant. So my analysis begins by borrowing Indris and Sandra Cook's heuristic framework in their work, Location Matters, the Rhetoric of Counterpublics and Their Cultural Performances. And there they name place as rhetoric and place as protest. They say, quote, social movements often deploy place rhetorically in their protest, which demonstrates how the reconstruction of place, even temporarily, may be considered a rhetorical tactic alongside traditionally associated tactics, such as speech, marches, and signs, close quote. In this light, this specific scene becomes a site to protest, a place within a space, if you will. I appropriate their focus on traditional material and oral artifacts into the visual culture of film. To make it work for film, I further refine the definition of place and space. To do so, I use Blair, Dickinson, and Ott's introduction to rhetoric, memory, and place. And they delineate space as, quote, open, undifferentiated, undesignated, and place as bordered, specific, locatable. So most specifically, though, I'm claiming their naming of space as allowing movement and place as the pause. As a result, my working definitions become place, excuse me, space is movement and place is pause. For my analysis, protest equals disruption of the so-called human gaze taken from work by Randy Malamute. The human gaze is the manner that humans look at or look past animals placed in human environments. And further, I'm disrupting the way the human gaze disguises animals as mere symbols. Malamud's concept directly adapts Laura Mulvey's feminist critique of the male gaze directed at women. Just as women are objectified to titillate and hold a male gaze, animals are thus manipulated to be passive raw material for the active gaze of the human. Animals must perform, obey, provide service, exemplify their species, or show monetary value to earn their right to be visible in a human constructed world. Malamud says the frequent mockery of non-human animals results from decontextualizing them into human spaces, which disguises the animals amid what he calls cultural frippery. So protesting this human gaze by disruption situates it, situates it within a vegan studies lens, specifically as critical animal media studies. Challenging the manufactured consent of animal exploitation, its examination of culture is an ethical activism, locating examples of, of exploitation in literary text, film, and media. Therefore, I use it as my critical lens to guide my working definitions. And just as an in ethical animal studies, such an approach questions what Diane Davis calls, quote, the putatively solid disorder between the human and the animal that grounds the history of philosophy and the history of rhetoric in Judeo-Christian religions and even Western culture itself. 
So the plight of animals mostly gets left out of the same discourses vegan studies and critical animal media studies tends to enrich. And despite the fact that, as Lisa Flores says, violences share a fundamental grammar, a rhetorical logic. And as Laura, uh, Laura Wright notes, all violences are rhetorically linked. So therefore, vegan theory becomes a mode of study and a means of critique focusing unapologetically on ignored animal exploitation and openly disguised in culture. That background centers my analysis on, of this iconic scene, one that encapsulates much of the film's theme, another blurry line drawn between man and machine, human and human replicant, directly linked to the line drawn between human animals and non-human animals. So applying this framework, I argue that the frenetic energy that of the scene exemplifies space as movement in a highly fluid exchange between the human and the human replicant as they fight for their lives, transitioning from the free street into a large abandoned building across multiple floors and levels, finally spilling onto the rooftop for the wet, bloody, climactic moment. Lost in this dynamic action is the instance where the replicant pictured here, acquires a dove that he holds tightly capped, grasped in one hand. He performs the entirety of the scene, clasping this dove, its wings useless from the replicant's grip. The sole purpose of the immobilized paused dove is the scripted release from the replicant's dying hand. The dove's sole role is to represent a soul leaving a body. Symbolic of the soul, the Holy Spirit, and or peace, it embodies cultural remembrance derived from Christian iconography. I call for looking past the default human gaze to see the dove as an exploited, exploited live prop depicting a human cultural symbol, an animal captured, arrested, and restricted, unwillingly paused and used, a type of rhetorical and physical violence. The movement of the scene is the space, while the paused dove is the place that becomes a site of protest to disrupt the human gaze. Enacting this critical lens views the dove not as a soul flying forth from a body, but as a captive animal escaping a human grasp. So in conclusion, the, this perspective renders the dove a highly rhetorical being in the following ways. The scene meets Indris and Sendakuk's criteria for their heuristic framework because the dove is both materially and symbolically semi-bound. The dove is what James Jasinski describes as artless, present in the space, yet invisible to the audience, as invisible as water to a, to a fish. It's as though the dove were always there rather than placed there. The dove makes this protest legible, meaning that the humans named, bordered, and invented it in particular ways that rendered it, rendered it recognizable by its symbolic and material intervention. Because symbols hold memory in place, the dove is an index for the human soul. It symbolically carries weight and further legibility as a memory place as well. And memory places prescribe particular paths of entry, in this instance through religion, traversal, walking through life inspired by religious iconography, and exit, death as a path to heaven. The dove as a singular memory place tells that entire story. The climactic exit of the dove is the metaphorical lifting of the soul up to heaven. That is, until the human gaze is disrupted to see that, in reality, it's merely the exit of a captive animal. Disrupting the, the default human gaze using cultural artifacts, such as iconic films like Blade Runner, does what David Lowenthal calls for in memory work. Quote, it selects, distills, distorts, and transforms the past, accommodating things remembered to the needs of the present. Close quote. Finally, this artifact highlights the human tendency to reduce animals to symbols. As we all work to reduce harm in the world, we must ponder Kelly Happy's question, quote, which bodies best serve to accommodate discourses of civil rights and egalitarianism? My analysis says that studying the harm done to animal bodies best serves confrontation to harmful norms because every violence ever enacted on humans was and still is practiced on animals, which is why disrupting the human gaze in animals is cultural representation and beyond is needed, validating the dove in Blade Runner, a place in a space to be protested. Thank you for your time and attention.